Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Milliken. Thank you, Mackenzie Laurier Institute. Thank you, friends. Thank you, Ms. May. I, I was really pleased and excited by Ms. May's um, pr presentation because I think she did um, a, a, a really an excellent job of indicating and sometimes dealing very explicitly with the complexities and nuances of this very painful, very traumatic human question. Some of you may remember the old Crossfire program. When it was mercifully taken off the air, um, I wrote a note, I was then doing a lot of work at CNN, I wrote a note to the director of the network that I thought they should replace Crossfire, which was a show in which people repeated talking points at each other, with a program where you would take two people of opposing points of view, give them an issue, and not let them off the set until they had worked out a solution they both agreed with. Um, and I know we have limited time, but the doors are going to be bolted, and that is <laughs> what we're going to do tonight. Because I think we can do this, actually. And I, I, I may be failing the obligations of a debate, but I think we can work out some things that we are all going to be able to agree with. Now, let me say, just as Elizabeth May had some reservations about the art case she was supposed to argue, I have some reservations of the case I am here to argue. I think there is an important place for selective and individual asylum. Where, people, where individuals have a well-founded fear of persecution for things they themselves have done or, people, or, think, or statuses they themselves are, whether they are a religious minority like Yazidis, whether they are a sexual minority, gays and lesbians. Um, that kind of person, I think, will need refuge somewhere outside of the region. They will not find uh, a shelter in the region. And I think we are seeing also an expulsion from the region of Christian populations in something like an organized pogrom. Um, and they, too, I think, are going to need some kind of um, resettlement. Uh, I, what I'm objecting to here is mass resettlement in the sense of more than some thousands of, indi of, of individual people selected for their individual characteristic. What I'm objecting to is the settlement of very large numbers of people chosen because of their characteristic as victims or participants in some cases, or in any case, people uprooted by a civil war. And to understand why. I think we need to wrap our minds around the scale of this problem and its true root causes. Um, I, my, I, have, I came with slightly different numbers than Elizabeth May, but they're close enough. Um, the numbers I have are 5 million Syrians, former Syrians outside the country, 7 million internally displaced, um, and about a, million, a couple of million, or nearly so, who have already migrated without permission to Europe. It is an enormous, enormous population. And it's not the end. Because Syria is the future for much of the rest of this region. We are seeing, we have seen conflict in Iraq. We have seen conflict in Afghanistan. Um, there is tremendous turmoil in Pakistan. What is the root cause of this? Um, the Middle East, the great Middle East, North Africa, and the greater Muslim world is going through a demographic crisis that is leading to war. The reason there was so much violence in the region is not because of somebody did this in 2011 and somebody mistook or misunderstood some UN doctrine in 2007. Uh, since 1950, the population of the Middle East, North Africa region has quadrupled, gone up by four times. This is the largest and fastest rate of increase anywhere on the planet. Most of the rest of the world is reaching now some kind of demographic stability. China and India, they are, 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 their populations are peaking. Uh, populations in North America, Europe, Latin America, everywhere we are, we are reaching um, a sustainable equilibrium of population and the planet. That is not so true in Sub-Saharan Africa and it is extremely not true in the Middle East. Um, this extraordinary surge of population um, has bumped up against a failure of the region to make an economic transition. Everywhere else, big population has not been a problem because we have moved to more advanced methods of production. But in the Middle East, to give you an example from Syria, Syria in the year of my birth, 1960, had a GDP per capita higher than that of South Korea. Today, the South Korean GDP per capita is 40 times that of Syria. So economic stagnation, massive population increase in an area of very limited natural resources, especially water. Uh, this has led to a population explosion of young men. The median age in Syria before the Civil War was 22. And unlike um, the, po the population grids everywhere else, look like well-wrought vases with a bulge in the middle, uh, typically about in the 40s. And that's true whether you're looking at 
middle-income countries like Mexico, relatively poor countries like, like China, or the rich countries of the West. In the West, the bulge is a little bit higher. In um, the poor countries, it's a little bit lower. In Syria, it is a complete, and the Middle East, North Africa region, it's a complete triangle with the largest groups of population, um, people under 25. So it is not a surprise that there is violence, and there is going to be, tragically, a lot more of it. And with violence comes displacement. Now, it's hard for us in this room, and especially I think it is hard for Canadians, to think about this in a detached way. As Elizabeth May so rightly said, Canadians are extraordinarily generous and caring people. And they want to believe the best, and they, want, they, ha they have much, and they want to give it. And that is a completely admirable and laudable sentiment. We also live, not just Canadians, but all of us, in an age of social media and instantaneous availability of images. Um, images, um, horrifying and beautiful, shape our thinking in a way that text shaped the thinking of previous generations. And that gives us the possibility to form emotional connections across a planet in a way that could never be done before. But it also has, and you, I'm sure uh, we're speaking to an older group, I can speak a little candidly about this, and some of our younger friends and relatives, um, we have seen a, a, a difficulty in thinking abstractly and precisely about problems because of the power of images. And the Syrian case um, is an example, uh, example. Everything that was true about Syrians was true before that poor boy washed up on the beach. And all the difficulties that were, uh, all, the, all the challenges and difficulties, they were all the same before and after. And yet that one image changed dramatically the policy and thinking of countries around the world. Um, and I understand why that's so, but one of the challenges we have as people who have responsibilities to the future um, is to think about why that should be so. Because this brings us to a third challenge that we face, especially with human populations. Human beings who are suffering, human beings who are in danger. Um, it is difficult and yet it is necessary to think about trade-offs and costs. Here's a cost that you should bear in mind. The cost of resettling a Syrian in Canada, according to the UN High Commission, um, is about 12 times the cost of settling a Syrian in the region. So you can settle for every one person you resettle in Canada or the United States or some other developed countries. You can provide water and materials um, and housing and shelter and some kind of beginning of, uh, of employment and training. You can provide 12 uh, to people in the region. Now that would not be such a trade-off if it, the population were like the Vietnamese boat people, a population of 50,000. We said, we'll just take everybody and bear the cost. But when you're talking about a population in Syria in the double-digit millions and a population in Iraq people are going to be coming of many more, and of future crises to come. Um, there are, eight, according to the French Defense Ministry, right now, there are 800,000 people in Libya who are actively trying to find boats to cross the Mediterranean and come to France. And if they succeed, there will be millions and millions more. Uh, this is a vast global migration on a scale unprecedented in the history of the world. And it is not one where it is easy to distinguish between who is a migrant and who is a refugee. That's a distinction that is used that is very important in law, but it doesn't make a lot of difference in fact. A migrant is somebody who is drawn, a refugee is somebody who is pushed, but all human action is really a combination of both. That when the doors are open, there will be millions and millions and millions of people who seek to come. Canada needs people, and Canada has benefited enormously from migration. But human beings are not indistinguishable inputs like ingots of copper. People come with skills, they come with attributes, and we need to recognize what those are if we're to make intelligent decisions. I mentioned the median age of Syrians is 22. Uh, the average, before the war started, the average amount of formal education of Syrians was six years. Since the war, that number has gone down dramatically. Uh, schooling has just completely vanished from Syrian life. But even in peacetime, six years of formal schooling, about a fifth of Syrians worked as agricultural laborers. Female literacy was significantly lower than male. This, uh, despite the happy talk you sometimes hear from the German Council of Industry, um, this is not a population that is going to make a ready adjustment to the economy of an advanced country. Um, Der Spiegel, uh, um, in an article that was published about a month after Angela Merkel made her famous uh, opening, her tweet that opened the doors of Germany to 1.1 million migrants in a matter of months, Der Spiegel described the mood of Germany as the initial euphoria has yielded to a mood of uneasiness verging on panic. And what they, the Germans are discovering is their Syrian population is close to unemployable in Germany. The, 
uh, median way, the median cost to a German employer of a private sector worker is 32 euros an hour after you include all the benefits, all the costs. There is just no way that those people with six years of formal education um, are going to arrive with anything like the skills and attributes needed to succeed in the German economy, especially because so many of the most important skills to succeed in a modern economy are soft skills that are culturally formed. If you can't take orders from a female supervisor, you are not going to succeed in a Western economy. And the people who are arriving in, from Middle East and North Africa cannot do that. If you cannot coexist easily with people of a different faith, you're not going to do well in a developed country. And the Syrian, the Syrian refugee camps in Germany are plagued by violence between different groups, with Sunni Muslims attacking Christians. Christians are actually one of the reasons that you'll know about a tenth of the population of Syria is Christian, but only about 2% of the refugee flow is, is Christian. And the reason for that disparity is because you don't begin the process of becoming a recognized refugee unless you enter yourself into the UN system, which starts with the camps where the Christians won't go because they fear violence from the Sunni Muslim majority. Um, it is not, it, it would be kind of a mistake, it would be a serious mistake to think of what is going on in Syria as a war between two small armed gangs with the vast majority of people innocently and indifferently caught in between them. This is a true civil war between uh, warring populations in which many, many people have had varying degrees of participation and in which both sides draw considerable support from, from just about everybody on one side or the other. That's why the war has been so protracted and so horribly violent. It's because a lot of people agree to some degree or another, they may not bear arms themselves, with the ideals of either the, um, the, uh, the Sunni side or the, or the, the government side, uh, and they bring those views with them. Canada is an amazing place, but it is not a magical place. People do not lose sight of who they are in 10 minutes or 10 months or 10 years. Um, it takes a generation or two um, to refashion migrants uh, to fit into their new world. Now, we talk a lot about screening, uh, and I think that's an important thing to do, but we must face the fact that in any practical sense, screening is impossible, and in a deeper sense, it's irrelevant. And here's why screening is impossible. People are coming from a war zone. There, are, uh, there is, how do you check the identity of somebody from Syria? What database do you use? There is none. And if there were any, would you trust a database provided to you by the Assad government? You know, how do you know whether this person um, is, uh, is, is the person he says he is with the background he says he's got? Who can you check that against? The, the, uh, database process is slow, not because it's exhaustive, because they actually do very little work, as I, I have debated this with people who have worked in that process. It's slow because of the amount of, of cases they have to document. But each case gets a very cursory examination, because in the end you can't know. Um, but in any case, this whole matter of screening, it's irrelevant anyway. Because what we have seen with the migration of Middle Eastern populations to Western Europe is the problems show up in the second generation, in the people who are born in the country. Um, the parents arrive, um, they're nervous, this is a new world, they don't speak the language, they get by as best they can. Um, the children are born in this new country, but this acculturation does not happen so fast. And those of us who have immigrant backgrounds ourselves, as I do, understand uh, migration is extraordinarily difficult and stressful and makes demands on us. Um, and those demands are, um, have become only harder as we have moved into a world in which muscle counts for less and these soft skills count for more. So what we are seeing across the continent of Europe, which has already received a 